Let's continue our discussion of oxidation and reduction with the process of photosynthesis. I'd suggest that you um, reference your study guide and fill out the photosynthesis summary sheet uh, just as I suggest suggested for cellular respiration. Um, and again, keep using those study guides, um, keep working through those just to help you keep um, all of this information straight. Just like cellular respiration, you will need to know the overall chemical reaction for photosynthesis as well as the inputs and outputs of the various processes. You'll find this BioFlick uh, photosynthesis video linked on Blackboard. Um, I would suggest that you watch that as sort of of an overview or a review of the process. Um, it's just sort of a quick, concise uh, little video on the actual light reactions in Calvin cycle. So let's get started with the process of photosynthesis. All energy on Earth comes from the sun. Plants take in sunlight and store that energy in carbon bonds. Uh, consumers eat plants and then energy is transferred through the food web. Some energy is converted into physical structures such as leaves, trunks, um, ultimately bones and skin and things if you're talking about an animal. Um, not all of the energy we need uh, comes from photosynthesis. Some of it's locked, it, locked up um, and later released as we burn it um, or use it up. Think about uh, burning wood in a fire or um, using coal energy, oil, gas. Um, all of those energy sources are carbon based and ultimately um, all of that energy was harnessed um, through the process of photosynthesis. So really, um, besides just photosynthesis converting energy into uh, molecules that another organism is going to eat, um, it really harnesses all of the energy, all of the power that we need um, on the planet. Um, so in the process of photosynthesis, energy um, from the sun um, is converted into usable chemical energy. So we all know that the sun warms things up, provides a lot of heat, but heat is not useful in a living organism um, past the point of maintaining a, a proper body temperature in some organisms. Um, too much heat in the chemical system is going to cause problems to proteins and enzymes and um, things are going to become dysfunctional. But also, heat can't be used directly. So the process of photosynthesis uh, brings in sunlight energy and uh, stores it in the bonds of organic molecules. Um, those organic molecules are used to either directly or indirectly feed the entire biosphere. Um, and we'll talk about that process a, a little bit later. Um, once those biological molecules are consumed, um, they're moved into uh, the mitochondria for cell, uh, into glycolysis and then the mitochondria for cellular respiration, um, where they're broken down and carbon dioxide is released. Um, also, the uh, carbon dioxide that is released from the mitochondria is uh, the same carbon dioxide that is used by plants um, to convert into those organic molecules. So we see a cycle here. Um, photosynthesis and cellular respiration are directly linked. Photosynthesis brings in carbon dioxide and light energy and locks up that light energy into those carbon bonds. Um, and it is those organic molecules that are broken down during cellular respiration to produce ATP. Um, once a, a plant or a photosynthetic organism uh, fixes the carbon or locks it up in those organic molecules, there are two ways that an organism can acquire energy. Um, some organisms are autotrophs. This means they're self-feeders. Um, it means that they can convert sunlight energy into usable energy on their own. We call these producers um, because they are uh, basically producing the energy source for the entire biosphere. 
you guys are most familiar with plants. Uh, basically anything that's green on our planet, uh, naturally green, um, are organisms that are performing photosynthesis. Um, but it's not just plants. Um, there are bacteria that do this as well, uh, cyanobacteria, um, algae will also perform photosynthesis. Some eukaryotes will perform photosynthesis. Um, they're all unicellular eukaryotes, so they're all protists. Um, but all of these organisms um, can produce their own uh, food energy um, without consuming another organism. They don't all do this using uh, sunlight and carbon dioxide. Um, some will also reduce sulfur, um, so they'll turn sulfur into an energy source. Um, and so there are a variety of different types of autotrophs. We are going to be looking specifically at photoautotrophs. Photoautotrophs are organisms who use light energy um, to produce their organic molecules and to store uh, chemical energy. Um, those organisms who are using something other than light, who are using some sort of chemical source, like our purple sulfur, sulfur bacteria there, are called chemiautotrophs. So they're using a, a chemical. They're um, getting energy from breaking chemical bonds and storing it uh, in a different form. The other way that an organism uh, can acquire food is by being a heterotroph. So the heterotrophs are unable to make their own organic molecules. And when I say this, I don't mean that they can't um, convert sugars from one form to the other or they can't build their own proteins, but they can't fix carbon. Um, that means they can't incorporate carbon um, or another molecule into a stored energy form. They can't take the energy directly and store it. They have to acquire energy that's already been stored. And these are our consumers. Um, there are different levels of consumers depending on who is eating who. Um, and we don't actually get into those levels too much here. Um, if you go into Bio 102, uh, we do talk about the different uh, trophic levels and food webs and things like that. But we're going to stick with just some sort of basic definitions of consumers. Our primary consumers are going to be our herbivores. So those are our organisms that are directly eating plants. So we've got a gorilla over there. Um, he's eating that plant. Um, and there are a lot of other organisms who are primary consumers. Um, think about um, our, our uh, deer and elk and uh, cows, things like that. Um, and then we have our carnivores. So those are uh, secondary or even tertiary consumers. They are eating other organisms. Um, they are usually not also um, eating plants. Usually carnivores are only eating uh, other organisms. So we have two examples down there on the bottom. We have that great white shark eating a seal and then we have that pack of wolves hunting this elk. Um, and then we have our omnivores. Those are our consumers that eat both plants and animals. Um, finally, we have our uh, decomposers and detritivores. So these organisms are consumers, but they're not eating other living organisms. Um, they are uh, decomposing or breaking down um, uh, other organisms. Um, and they also can um, sometimes be considered parasites if they are sort of infecting something that's already living and, and then killing it. Um, but that doesn't fit neatly into this category. Um, so our decomposers and our detritivores are really important because they are um, releasing the chemical energies that um, has been stored and now the animal has died. So something else is probably not going to eat it. And so these are really important in sort of recycling the carbon uh, within our uh, system here. As we begin to talk about the actual process of photosynthesis, um, we need to talk about chloroplasts. So we've talked about chloroplasts before. Um, chloroplasts are our photosynthetic organelle. We're mostly going to be talking about chloroplasts in the plant cell. 
So that's where our focus is going to be. But there are other similar photosynthetic uh, pigments that are found in some of our other photosynthetic organisms. Um, so all of the uh, enzymes and proteins and molecules required for photosynthesis um, are packed into this chloroplast. Um, remember, we have previously talked about the endosymbiont theory. Um, and this is the theory that um, an ancestral eukaryotic cell engulfed a mitochondria, so it could use oxygen to um, store uh, energy, I'm sorry, use oxygen to uh, produce energy from chemical bonds. Um, and then some of them actually engulfed a second uh, prokaryote um, that was able to perform photosynthesis. So that's the origin of our chloroplast. Um, it, both the mitochondria and the chloroplast formed this symbiotic relationship inside that ancestral eukaryotic cell. So this line of uh, this ancestral photosynthetic eukaryote um, leads to our modern day photosynthetic plants. So that's where we're going to focus our attention. Our chloroplasts are found um, mostly in the leaves, but they really can be found anywhere on a plant that is green. Um, that green color indicates a high concentration of chloroplasts there. Um, if we're talking about the leaf structure, chloroplasts are found um, in the cells of a layer called the mesophyll on the leaf. Um, so let's talk a little bit about leaf structure because the leaf structure is really important for the function, for their function, which is photosynthesis. Remember our book likes to talk a lot about structure and function and so leaves are uh, shaped and arranged specifically for the function of photosynthesis. Um, they are usually broad and flat to increase their surface area that's going to be exposed to the sun so there's um, larger area for those chlorophyll molecules to absorb the light energy um, and they're usually really thin and the reason that they're usually thin is that they're performing some gas exchange with the environment and if they're going to efficiently move uh, gases through their structure they need to be thin. So if you look at our leaf here we have um, these veins that are running throughout the leaf. These are important in bringing uh, water and sugar um, up from the roots through the stem and out to the leaves. Um, and the water is gonna be important um, in photosynthesis. So we need to make sure that our plant has enough water there. Um, and then the leaf also needs to bring in carbon dioxide and it needs to release oxygen. So remember in the process of photosynthesis, those excuse me, those plants are bringing in carbon dioxide and then they're releasing oxygen, which we need for cellular respiration. So if we take a look at this cross section, we see the mesophyll layer of our cells. Uh, we have an outside layer and on the top and the bottom here. Those are usually kind of waxy, um, just to sort of limit too much water loss. Um, and then in here, we have our individual cells that contain a variety of chloroplasts. So each one of those chloroplasts provides a lot of surface area for photosynthesis to take place. Gas exchange is performed through those structures called stomata. Stomata are specialized cells on usually on the other underside layer of a leaf. That's where they're shown here. Um, and they open and close um, depending on um, whether or not the cell needs to perform photosynthesis. So uh, we don't talk about the mechanism for that, but uh, water is really important in keeping those um, cells opened and closed and um, they open and close based on the movement of water due to um, osmotic balance. So we talked about in chapter five, but those stomata are uh, regulated and allowed to open and close as the process of photosynthesis moves on. Um, and they need to open and close because the plant needs to bring in carbon dioxide and it needs to release its waste product, which is oxygen. So let's do a quick review of chloroplasts. I know we've seen this um, in chapter four when we talked about the cell parts. I talked about it in chapter seven, so we won't spend too much time on it here. Remember that those uh, stacked 
grana or uh, in this uh, thylakoid, or I'm sorry, these thylakoids are stacked into granum and they are folded because that allows for increased surface area for the process of photosynthesis. Just like the process of cellular respiration, some of our proteins are actually embedded in that membrane. And the more surface area we have, the more photosynthesis um, sort of steps can take place, or the, the more reactions is probably a better word, the more reactions can take place. Um, so our uh, chlorophyll molecule, which is our light absorbing pigment, is going to be embedded in these uh, thylakoid membranes. Inside, uh, you can see this darker green, uh, that's the thylakoid space. Some of our process is going to occur in there. Remember that the chloroplast has an inner and outer membrane. That's an indication that it was uh, initially its own uh, bacteria-like organism, and then it also has its own DNA and its own ribosomes. Over here we see uh, an individual cell. All of these little green um, bubbles here are actually the uh, chloroplasts. So there are many, many chloroplasts in each mesophyll cell with, within the leaf. All right, so photosynthesis is an oxidation reduction reaction. Uh, remember, that means that there's a transfer of energy and electrons um, between different atoms. So cellular respiration was an oxidative process where the electrons and energy were removed from glucose um, and we, the result was lower energy products. Carbon dioxide is a low energy product. Um, so cellular respiration was an exergonic reaction. Um, it released energy. Um, photosynthesis can generally be thought of as the opposite. Um, in photosynthesis, we go from a low energy carbon dioxide to high energy glucose molecules. So this means that we have an endergonic reaction. We have to add energy into that reaction. It's uh, anabolic. We're building up that carbon dioxide, um, which also means we are reducing carbon dioxide into glucose. Carb the carbon in the carbon dioxide is going to gain electrons, so it's going to gain energy um, as we build the bonds into glucose. So this process of photosynthesis, um, where we take six carbon dioxide, some water and some light, and convert it into glucose, six oxygens and six waters, um, is something called carbon fixation. So carbon fixation is the initial incorporation of carbon into organic compounds. So it's the point where we take uh, basically, as far as energy is concerned, unusable carbon dioxide, and we incorporate it into something that is usable. Um, oxygen is an important byproduct of this reaction. We need it for cellular respiration. Um, and it is produced as sort of a rearrangement of bonds that were, uh, one, that were once in the water molecules that are required as part of photosynthesis. Again, that carbon is incorporated into glucose. Um, and then down here on the bottom, it shows where all of these molecules are coming from. Um, we generally talk about photosynthesis as sort of the opposite of cellular respiration, and it's only um, really the opposite when it's written on paper because we're not uh, directly converting uh, carbon dioxide uh, fully into glucose. We're sort of rearranging things and moving some oxygens and adding some hydrogens. Um, and so it's, it's not just an, an immediate reversal of the process. Um, carbon dioxide is found in the ax in sorry in the atmosphere, um, and that's because organisms are bre breathing it out as a byproduct of cellular respiration. Um, our hydrogen comes from the water, and then of course our energy comes from the sun. Um, don't forget, you need to memorize this formula, as do as you need to memorize the cellular respiration and fermentation formulas. So carbon fixation is really important. Um, as I said, it is the incorporation of carbon into organic molecules. 
we're going to be using glucose as our main uh, source, our main uh, carbon, sorry, organic compound that we're going to be building. Um, but it's not always um, necessarily uh, glucose. It's just, an, it's, it's the one that works nicely in the equation, and so that's, that's what we're going to focus on. Um, during the process of carbon fixation, um, remember I said that it is anabolic, it's a building reaction, um, and it's an endergonic reaction. It's a reaction that requires an input of energy. And that energy is going to be stored in those bonds uh, that make up the glucose molecule. Um, keep in mind, um, just to sort of keep things straight, that carbon dioxide is a low energy molecule. And so by using it, using the bonds that we can form between those carbons, um, that's where we get our storage of energy. Cellular respiration, we said, uh, was an oxidation reaction where electrons were transferred away from glucose um, to oxygen. Um, and so uh, our glucose molecule is losing electrons, oxygen is gaining electrons. In photosynthesis, um, we have uh, the reduction of carbon dioxide into a sugar. Um, so energy is for, sorry, stored in the form of sugar um, as we build up that glucose molecule. So here we see um, our carbon dioxide being reduced. It is gaining electrons, and those electrons are gained by forming all of these bonds around it, all those oxygen and hydrogen bonds. Um, and then the oxygen in uh, the water is what is being oxidized. So oxygen is losing electrons as it's being turned into, um, I'm sorry, water is losing electrons as it's being turned into oxygen. This whole process of photosynthesis is broken down into two parts, um, the light reactions and um, sometimes called the dark reactions, but the uh, real name is the Calvin cycle. Um, and so before we can talk about the light part of photosynthesis, we need to actually talk about how light behaves.